I wasn't surprised by the reaction of the dollar and, and gold and silver in response to the policy decision, the policy statement, and the Powell presser. However, what I found interesting is that the mining stocks actually fared much better than the rest of the stock market. Today's show with Dave Kranzler is brought to you by Miles Franklin Precious Metals, where this week only you can get backdated one ounce silver maple leaves for only $3.75 over spot. To find out more or get any of your questions answered, email us at arcadia at milesfranklin.com. And now on to the show. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And we are recording today shortly after the Wednesday Federal Reserve statement and press conference, which I know is my guest, Dave Pranzler. It's one of his favorite times of the year. I mean, some people look forward to 4th of July or Christmas or Hanukkah <laughs> or Valentine's Day for Dave when Jerome Powell talks and Steve Leesman watches. That's that's his Super Bowl <laughs> and fortunately, he's joining me so we can dig through things with the Federal Reserve. Also, a couple of things to touch on in the gold and silver markets. We'll talk about the reaction in gold and silver to the Fed, amongst other things, and some of the latest data. But Dave, with all that said of investment research dynamics, a pleasure to have you on in here as always. And nice to catch up and record with you today. And how are you, my friend? I'm doing well. It's always a pleasure to be here. Well, I feel honored to get some FaceTime on the same day as Jerome. So um, would you like to first start with some uh, comments on his press release that I know had you quite excited? Um, yeah. So first of all, recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a solid pace. Well, What's interesting about that is he's he's referencing the GDP report. And several several people smarter than me wrote articles that just completely annihilated the GDP report in terms of, of the amount of rigging that went on. I'm trying to I had it in my last um short sellers newsletter. And Dave, perhaps I'm see if I can find it. But uh, at, at any rate, um, <clears throat> you know, probably the biggest rig was the price deflator. They used a, a GDP price deflator of one and a half percent. Now, there's no way on earth that that real inflation is at one and a half percent. But what that does is it it makes it 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 um, so the number that they report is is adjusted by. The price deflator, so they call it real GDP, but um, all that does is make the the numerator, the actual um, calculation, produces a much bigger GDP than it than it should be. If they were, I mean, imagine if they were using just the CPI inflation number, which we also know is bogus. So, you know, at any rate, the GDP is not a really good barometer of of the the relative strength or weakness of the economy. So you know what what I find interesting is you got to wonder why, and, and I'm sure they must know this because the Fed has access to what much better data than than the public has access to, right? So my my view is is that well, and the other thing is they say inflation is coming down, right? Well, I mean. You know, real world experience tells us that inflation is much higher than the CPI is representing it to be. So um, and if inflation is coming down like that, then why aren't they cutting rates? I think they have to to um, say that the economy is expanding at a solid pace because I think they're trying to protect the dollar. And the reason why I say that is, I mean, the dollar was getting ready to crap until today's meeting. And it, it bounced almost 100 basis points from the bottom today, you know, earlier in the morning, you know, before the meeting started. And the reason why that is important is because they've got, there, there's going to be a much larger 
funding of the treasury deficit than that report that came out yesterday and today suggested. And everyone knows that. The Fed knows that. And so, and, and part of their problem funding the, the new treasury issuance and the refinancing actually, is that our largest foreign financiers like China, uh, Saudi Arabia, and even Japan, they're starting to pull back on their participation in, in uh, treasury auctions. And that that's part of the reason why you're seeing when they do auctions from 10 out, you know, out to 10, 20, and 30 years, the recent auctions, um, several of them have, have like not gone well at all. So, and that and the banks have to take down whatever can't be sold. At some point, the Fed is gonna have to start printing money to to bridge the gap and 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 take take that debt onto its balance sheet or give the banks more capital so that they can they can bridge the gap. So, and if if the dollar's in a tailspin going lower, that makes that that makes it even you know more likely that foreigners aren't going to participate because that that's just a money losing proposition for them. So, um, I, I think that's why he has to get up there and say the economy is is strong. Yeah, and I guess the one thing I would add to that is that there's also the impact of the deficits and how much money the government is spending. If you weren't running a deficit and that money came out, I think we'd see a much different picture in terms of what those GDP numbers and the other strength indicators. And you sent me over this chart earlier today. Let's see if we can zoom into this a bit, but showing the Dallas Fed, the New York Fed, Kansas City Fed, Richmond Fed, and we see a lot of metrics showing below zero. Although, Dave, let's let's give you a little taste of what Jerome said at the press conference. I have uh, three short clips pulled up here. Maybe we can get a quick comment on each one. But you were talking about confidence in getting inflation back down. So let's let's take a listen here. Data, which have been surprisingly strong against inflation data. Oops, got that double speed. I, I listen to get twice as much Jerome in as possible. <laughs> okay. So what are we looking for to get greater confidence? Um, let me say that we have confidence. We're, we're, we're looking for greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down to 2%. Implicitly, we do have confidence and has been increasing, but we want to get greater confidence. What do we want? So that's a lot of confidence right there. So it seems like he does. We're, we're clear that there's confidence. Is that... Are you on board with that so far? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not on board with it, but sure. He had confidence in his confidence. <laughs> Take that as a no. Then, well, here, he, here, here was my thought because I was actually on my exercise bike, a road bike on rollers, and I was watching this, and I, I remember hearing that, and see. And two different reporters were bu bugging him about that question. You know, if, if inflation's trending down towards your target rate, why aren't you cutting rates? And and that's his the reason why he answers it that way. Because how do you define how are you going to put a definition on more confidence? You got six months of data where the CPI is trending lower, right? So what do you need to see? Twelve months. He's he's kind of dodging the question here or evading it because I th I th and this is just my view I don't know for sure I really think deep inside he, he knows that he probably needs to cut rates to to prop up the economy I mean you saw those are all regional Fed manufacturing and business activity reports they've all been negative for almost all of 2023 and the Dallas Fed has been negative for much longer than that T the Texas economy is 10 percent of the GDP. So how can you sit there and say the economy is strong and robust when your regional banks are reporting that it's not? But at any rate, I, I think he has to have kind of be evasive with that, defining what confidence means, because he, he knows inside he can't cut rates right now or he risks the dollar falling off a cliff. I think he's also confident that he knew you were going to ask about the strong economy and has the confidence to answer that one for you. So let's take well, another listen here. Isn't low enough. It is. It's just a question of can we take that with confidence that we're moving sustainably down to 2%. That's really what we're thinking about. In terms of, of uh, growth, um, we've had strong growth. I mean, if you take a step back, we've had strong growth, very strong growth last year. 
going now quick quick note to the audience watching at home as i play this watch the steam come out of dave's ears as he gets ready to explode right into the fourth quarter um and yet we've had a very strong labor market and we've had inflation coming down so I think, whereas a year ago we, we were thinking that we needed to see some softening in economic activity, that hasn't been the case. So Dave, did that answer your questions about the whole growth issue? I mean, either he really doesn't see the real data or he's lying. I, I mean, I wrote about this in my last issue of the Short Sellers Journal. There's a, there was a report out, an economic report that Fed national the Chicago Fed National Activity Index, and it it measures eighty five different private sector economic variables, um, and the the composite it, it's a it's a composite index, and it so it it fell to in December it fell to minus point one five. And it, it doesn't make very big moves. Anything above zero is the 85 indicators in aggregate are showing growth. Anything below zero, they're not showing growth. So uh, December, in November, it was at plus, they reported plus 0 0.03. They revised it down to plus 0 0.01 or 0 0.1. And then in November, it was minus 0 0.68. And that's, that's one of the lowest readings, the most negative readings I've ever seen in watching this index over many years. Um, the manufacturing, you know, and all of the hard economic type variables were all negative. And, and the reason why this is significant is because it's, it's, it's countrywide. It's not just a regional Fed report. So, I mean, and also the leading um, economic indicators, right? You know about those. You took economics in, in college and probably at Wharton. The leading economic indicators have been negative for something like 21 months in a row. So if you look at the LEI and the, and the Chicago Fed National Activity Index, how can you possibly say that the economy is growing? I mean, yeah, there's been a ton of government spending, and that's, that's keeping, in my view, that's keeping this economy from going into a deep depression. Because the government was, according to, I think, the employment report, the recent employment report, the government was the most aggressive at hiring people in in uh, December. So um, I, that's why I say either he's lying through his teeth or he really doesn't see the actual data. And I find the latter hard to believe. Well, fortunately, we have one more question. And rather than hearing his answer to this one, I'll just let you hear the question. And then you can tell me if you have any particular insight into that one. But here we go. Uh, very much. And uh, you mentioned um, below 2% inflation for on a three-month basis. Core PCE has been running at 1.5%. And there are those on Wall Street who think that if you maintain the level of restriction you have right now, you could end up with inflation running below your target. Uh, how do you see that? Dave, how do you see that one as a pseudo Fed chairman? Are you concerned about inflation running below the 2% target? <laughs> it's just a silly proposition. I mean, I don't know that there's anyone in any household across the country that would tell you that that the that what they're spending on necessities and and housing etc every month has is only went up is only going up at one and a half percent now i mean i buy pretty much the same basket of groceries on a weekly basis and it, it gets seems like it gets more expensive every week i think part of the problem i think the data is skewed by the price of gasoline which has come down a lot right well, with what's going on in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia cutting back production, I think we're we're about ready. You know, two or three months down the road, we're going to see gasoline do, um, you know, do a moonshot. Yeah, that was not mentioned in the press conference, but in either case, uh, did want to pull up because we did have an interesting reaction to his statement. Here we have the chart of the dollar index, which spiked quite a bit higher following the announcement 
And similarly, we see the inverse of that in the gold price here. We're having a nice day. It was up about 22 bucks uh, in the 2070 range. And then you see that it sold off here, has recovered a little bit. Similar with the silver price where uh, shot higher a little bit ahead of the meeting, then sold off, ending the day down about 17 cents. Uh, but any thoughts on the reactions in gold and silver and the dollar to the, the announcement we heard? Well, I, I mean, I think the reaction of the dollar underscores my point about what they're trying to do here. They're, they're trying to, to um, keep the dollar propped up. I mean, you know, prior to the meeting, it, it, you know, the dollar was down quite a bit from yesterday. So... And I think part of that is, I think part of the reason gold was, and you know, gold is in the COMEX market, right? So it's easy to push the price around. But part of the reason gold was up like that and the dollar was down is I think there was an expectation that the Fed was going to come out. And I actually thought the Fed was going to be a lot more dovish than it was today. But but see, there's another issue going on here. And again, this this boils down to, I believe that, I mean, they, they meet for two days and the Fed has the highest paid economic research department in the world. And so they, they get, and they get real data, data that doesn't get filtered out to the public. And, and so I think they know what, what the real rate of inflation is. And it's, it's much higher than the CPI rate. And I, I think they're worried about, you know, I call it the, the Frank, the, the inflation Frankenstein, it's still off the chain. They, I mean, yeah, maybe it's been reined in a little bit in some respects, but I mean, it, it, there's still, I mean, it seems like every month you read about, you know, whether it's auto insurance, health insurance, whatever, you know, all of a sudden starts skyrocketing again. I just read an article about auto insurance. My policy went up and I haven't had a ticket in probably two years, believe it or not. <laughs> I always admired your driving skills and your safety, Dave. Just got lucky, I guess. So, um, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't surprised by the reaction of the dollar and, and gold and silver in response to the policy decision, the policy statement, and the Powell presser. However, what I found interesting is that the mining stocks actually fared much better than the rest of the stock market. So as we were talking, the, the ARCA gold bug index was, was down less than half a percent on the day versus the Dow, which was up. 0.8, which was down 0.82%. The S&P was down 1.6%. Uh, and the NASDAQ was down 2.23%. So, so on, a, on a percentage basis, um, you know, the, the press metal se sector did way better than the, the rest of the stock market. I mean, silver, even though it's down, it's, it's still down less than the Dow was. And, and gold finished green on the day. And to me, I think that's pretty bullish for the sector. And Dave, add into that, uh, here we have the latest COT report with the swap dealers in silver back to very close to flat, about 1,200 contracts short, but that's been the range in the cycle where they don't typically get too long there, but seeing an evening there, perhaps suggesting we're near end of this current bottom sell-off. Yeah, you know what, what you don't have on there which is just, to me, it's even more interesting than than the than the banks almost being, you know, net long is the managed money, which is the hedge funds and the CTAs. They're now net short silver contracts. They're net short by about twenty six hundred contracts. So that that's and, and it doesn't always happen like this, but when we have the pattern where the, the the COMEX banks go net long silver and the hedge funds and the CTAs are net short silver, it, it usually precedes a nice move in the sector. And it doesn't always happen right away. It might be on a lagged basis. Like I think the last time around when we had a move like this after this type of pattern showed up, I think I think the bullion banks had already gone back to being net short by the time the rally started and really started taking off. So it's one of the indicators that I look at in terms of trying to judge whether I think we're going to have a nice move in the sector or not. Well, I certainly appreciate that and everything else that you shared here today. And 
perhaps the next time we do this, we'll have to get a primer of what you're expecting in March as certainly we are heading towards another Fed meeting and also expiration of the bank term funding program. About 50% probability priced in of a rate cut in March. I think we will likely be a little longer than that, although who knows what happens in between now and then. Although fortunately, the one way we know we can keep up to date with that is via your journals, the Short Sellers Journal and the Mining Stock Journal, which you can find at investmentresearchdynamics.com. And Dave, any uh, quick preview of some things you've been looking at or would like to share about the journals before we wrap up? Yeah. Um, well, I think my next short seller journal should be pretty interesting because um, I do think the stock market's getting ready to roll over. And today might have been a precursor to that. It has a long way to drop to get back to fair value, um, especially that the housing, the home builder stocks. Um, and in, in terms of um, the mining stock journal, I, I've actually started covering and recommending um, more mid cap and large cap, mainly mid cap producers. I, I used to be just kind of exclusively um, the junior micro cap project development stocks. And we're, we're starting to see some some nice basing in in really the entire sector, but especially some of these some of these large cap, you know, if you look at a chart of Newmont or say Hecla, for instance, Hecla didn't have a good day today, but you look at stocks like that, and the, the charts are set up bullishly, in my opinion. And we're starting to see the, um, some action in the junior microcaps also. There's, there's um, one junior microcap that I recommend, Cabral Gold, which I've mentioned many times in the past in, in public, so it's not like I'm screwing over my subscribers. Uh, and, and that's actually up nicely in the last three or four months. Um, and some of the other ones that I follow, you know, they're, they're not necessarily rallying right now, but they've stopped going lower and they've kind of flatlined. And I don't think it's going to take a lot to ignite a big rally in these in these micro cap stocks. And that's you want to be long those if and when we, we get a nice move higher in the sector, because that's that's where the real money can be made in those things. Forget Newmont and Barrick. Well. I appreciate that you're making something available to people where they can keep an eye on that. Obviously, you have a lot of insight into those mining stocks and something that I certainly enjoy reading myself. And you can find that at the link in the description field below for investmentresearchdynamics.com. And with that said, Dave, sure appreciate you being here. We'll look forward to doing this again soon. And uh, hopefully you can cool down after that hot bed <laughs> presser. But at least now people have a good idea of what actually happened today. And that said, we'll <laughs> wrap up. But thanks again for making some time, my friend. Thanks, Chris. Well, thanks to everyone at home watching. Just a reminder, today's show was brought to you by Miles Franklin Precious Metals, where this week only backdated one ounce silver maple leaves are only $3.75 over spot. And of course, Miles Franklin is there to help with any of your gold and silver buying or selling needs. You can find out more or get any of your questions answered by emailing us at arcadia at milesfranklin.com and also get your backdated maple leaves for only $3.75 over spot from one of the major sovereign mints around the world. So thanks to Miles Franklin and thanks to you watching at home. We'll see you again soon.